Hey, welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmid, and today we're going to be asking the question, why am I, me, Joe, why am I an agnostic? And so, uh, you know, we're going to be um, delving into the nature of agnosticism. What is agnosticism? What is theism? What is atheism? Different models of God, different arguments for and against God's existence um, that at least I personally find either plausible or lean towards thinking that they're, they're good and, and so on. So um, without further ado, let's get into the presentation. So before delving into the rest of the presentation, it's useful to get clear on the purpose, nature, and scope of this video. So the purpose is really to showcase and present my current location on the epistemological landscape. Uh, and I'll touch on what, what I mean by an epistemological landscape in the next slide. It's really so that you can understand me. Um, yeah, it's all, it's all about mutual understanding. And really, um, this kind of goes back to something that I was discussing with uh, Josh Rasmussen in my discuss discussion with him on my channel. I came to articulate it as perichoresis later on um, in some of my uh, Facebook direct messages with him. Um, and really, what perichoresis means is a sort of mutual indwelling uh, that occurs within the Trinitarian persons, within the hypostatic union, and other uh, Christian doctrines. But, um, you know, uh, I'm sort of abstracting it from the context of Christianity and Trinitarianism and things like that, and just talking about the sort of mutual indwelling. It's sort of this intertwinement of you with another person. Um, and I, it seems to me that that's really the, the sort of foundation of loving dialogue and productive dialogue, really truly coming to understand one another, almost uh, adopting their own position on the epistemological landscape and really trying to imp intellectually empathize with them. Um, that, that seems to me to be the best way to facilitate um, insight flow across uh, both ideological barriers and just across people. So really perichoresis I see as the foundation for dialogue and this is really just to help you and me um, engage in this kind of perichoresis, right? So you can understand me, where I'm coming from, uh, and so on. So it's really all about understanding and really about showcasing my present location um, on the epistemological landscape. And so let's turn next to the nature of my video. So the nature of the video is really more so uh, an explanatory video. It's more like a presentation video um, and much less a defense video. Um, of course, knowing me, I won't really be able to resist the latter, but, you know, I'll try. I'll try to resist the latter for the most part. Um, and with that said, you know, I, I'm really just trying to, again, showcase and present something and explain it. I'm not trying to defend any thesis or trying to convince anyone. Um, and so this is going to be unlike certain other of my videos where I am trying to showcase no, will not only showcase an argument, but really defend it, and um, yeah, defend it from attacks, try to justify it, and so on. Um, this video is decidedly different from that. I'm just trying to, I don't know, give you a, a glimpse into what I find convincing, and you know, uh, my position on the uh, the grand epistemological landscape. And then finally, the scope of the video. So um, clearly, this won't be comprehensive. I mean, you know. Thousands upon thousands of hours have probably gone into, you know, forming different views and positions and opinions on these various matters. Um, but it should be reasonably representative-ish, uh, <laughs> at least. Um, so uh, with that out of the way, we can turn next to the nature of justification. So again, as I conceive of it, and um, if, you're, if you're looking for further, you know, justification and, and further elaboration of this conception, definitely check out my discussion with Josh Rasmussen I had um, a, a couple weeks back. Um, but really justification is person-based. There's no such thing as a sort of justified belief in the abstract, abstracted from persons, that is. A justified belief is precisely that, a belief. That is to say, it is that which someone believes. Um, so you can't really abstract beliefs from the people that hold those beliefs. And moreover, different people will have different justifications for, for instance, the exact same belief. Some people have much more uh, justification and, and much more research uh, buttressing their view uh, on a particular belief or question than others. And so really, it seems to me that belief uh, or justification of a belief doesn't really make much sense in the abstract. You always have to look at it uh, from a sort of person-based standpoint. There is no, this belief is unjustified. That, that, that simply doesn't make any sense in my estimation. It's this person is justified in holding this particular belief, or this person is, just, is unjustified in holding this particular belief. Yeah, so that, that's the main, uh, the main thing that I want to get out of that first uh, bullet point uh, about the person-based nature of justification. Uh, the next element of the nature of justification that I want to touch on is that justification is really sight-based, right? It's based on what we ourselves see. And again, that's also based on 
um, you know, what a person is and their, their context, their epistemic context. Uh, whether or not someone is justified in something really depends on their experiences, both personal and intellectual, their intellectual seemings, or what philosophers call intuitions, their uh, priors, the, that is to say the prior probabilities that they assign to different varying hypotheses. Moreover, it depends on their expectations on different hypotheses, what they would expect given certain hypotheses and given certain data and so on. And again, these are going to vary from person to person based on a whole host, a whole concoction of their psychology, of their um, philosophical background, of their worldview, and so on. It's also going to depend on books and debates and videos that someone's uh, watched and been in and so on. My point here is just that um, justification is extremely person dependent. Uh, it's it's really dependent on on where you are uh, where you occupy yourself on the uh, epistemological landscape, which is just this whole landscape of different worldviews of different um, positions that you can occupy with respect to your different experiences, your different intellectual seemings, all of these different elements that that uh, of your intellectual and personal life that go into forming uh, and maintaining and sustaining uh, your beliefs. And then finally, the, the last element that I want to focus on in the nature of justification is just uh, how we are each sort of uniquely situated, right? We each occupy a unique location on the grand landscape, um, which is just this, this landscape of different worldviews, different beliefs, different intellectual seemings, different experiences, different books and debates and videos that we've all read, right? Um, it's, it's so very unique. With that out of the way, um, let's turn to what the question of what is an agnostic? So um, these are this is really my classification. Um, and so I break an agnostic down into three different types. First of all, there's an epistemic agnostic. Um, an epistemic agnostic holds that it is possible in principle to know some proposition P, but an assessment of the evidence concerning P on both sides, whether for P or against P, leaves the scales roughly counterbalanced to the person in question. And so uh, roughly they would have a sort of epistemic credence or confidence level. Um, or a degree of belief of something like 40% uh, confidence to a 60% confidence in a given proposition. And for our cases, that proposition is whether or not God exists. Um, yeah, and so 0.4, that just means 40%, of course, and 0.6, that just means 60%. Um, and of course, this is just very rough and loose. Um, uh, you know, it could be maybe 0. 0. 0.45 to 0. 0.55. Uh, it doesn't really matter for my purposes. Really, all that matters is that you're somewhere around half and half um, for your confidence level with respect to um, the the question of God's existence, and that uh, you th still think that it's possible in principle to know either way. It's just that your assessment of the evidence leaves the scales roughly counterbalanced, and that that's that's where I fall within these these three. Um, but the second one is what I call a suspension agnostic. A suspension agnostic suspends or withholds belief, judgment, or a, a credence, a credence assignment to P altogether. So they wouldn't even they wouldn't even say that it's roughly counterbalanced. They're just going to like not assign a probability whatsoever. Um, you know, they might say, "Oh well, it's somewhere between zero and one," but I don't even know where to where to put the pin, right? Um, and so uh, I do not fall under that. And then the last one is the in principle agnostic. So they hold that it's impossible to know P in principle. And so uh, in this case, they would say that it's impossible to know whether or not God exists in principle. Uh, and of course, I'm not an in principle agnostic. So, you know, we have to ask, are there really agnostics? Um, the short answer is yes, yes, there are. Um, it might sound weird uh, to, to ask this question, but I've genuinely had some people, um, you know, either comment at me or, or just, you know, uh, again, in, in a nice way, but they're, they're expressing uh, reservations about the existence of agnostics. And one of, the, one of the central arguments is what I'll call the argument from acting as if, right? So um, this argument would essentially go something like, well, I mean, listen, like there are two options, either God exists or God doesn't exist. Um, and you're acting like you, you act, you, you sort of act out your, your beliefs. And so you're either acting as if God exists, you're going to church, you're praying, you're doing these things, or you're acting as if God doesn't exist, right? You're just living your life uh, without, um, yeah, without going to church, without doing those things, right? Uh, and so there's really no no third option. There's no room for being an agnostic here. Um, and I just, I don't find this convincing, right? Um, I, I First of all, I mean, acting as if P does not entail that one believes P, and hence it's perfectly compatible for there to be agnostics, even though they may act as though theism or atheism is true, right? But I think secondly, and more importantly, um, I do think that this is missing a third option, right? There is a distinctly third option, which is acting as if agnosticism is true or, or rational, rather, or the correct epistemic choice, given one's position um, on the, the epistemic landscape. Uh, that is to say, um, one would be seeking with all one's might, with all one's power, with every fiber of one's being, right, uh, for some ultimate reality, right, that maybe you don't even know exists. You might occasionally say prayers like, God, if you exist, 
please help me discover you and serve you, something like that. Or uh, reading both theist and atheist literature with painstaking care and so on, right? I mean, all of these seem to be characteristically agnostic ways of acting. Um, and so it does seem to me that it's a false dichotomy. You can act as, as if atheism is true. You can act as if theism is true or, right, or you can act as if you genuinely don't know either way. That, that argument does not seem plausible to my mind. If, if you're looking for further reading on this, definitely check out uh, Dr. Paul Draper's Seeking But Not Believing, Confessions of a Practicing Agnostic. And uh, Paul Draper is from Purdue University, so uh, boiler up there. Uh, another question that someone asked me was like, am I agnostic on the nature of ultimate reality? Well, I mean, not really, right? The type of agnosticism we're talking about here is the question of whether or not God exists, right? Um, that is perfectly compatible with holding a lot, lots of other positions on the nature of ultimate reality. So for instance, I lean towards something like non-natural moral realism. Uh, I lean towards something like uh, a mixture of deontology and virtue ethics. I lean towards, you know, thinking that substances and their causal powers are the fundamental building blocks of reality. Um, I lean towards thinking that there is uh, some sort of metaphysically necessary thing, um, and so on, right? Like, I have, a, you know, it's perfectly fine to build your worldview in a very robust manner uh, without, um, without specifying uh, the precise intrinsic character of um, ultimate reality, whether it be uh, a sort of personal, foundational, ultimate, perfect mind, um, or whether it be something else. While there definitely is a sort of, um, there is a sort of element in there for further inquiry, right, obviously, but it doesn't debar me or debar anyone else from having uh, pretty substantive views about the nature of ultimate reality. So that's another uh, caveat that I want to get out of the way. Uh, but the long story short for this slide is just that there are agnostics, yes. And so before tackling different belief, uh, models of God. Um, it's worth getting a hold of the lay of the land, that is to say, what I mean by all these terms. So belief, um, some people get caught up with that, but belief is really just, it's just a propositional attitude. It's an attitude that a subject or a thinker takes toward a given proposition. So propositional attitudes are things like uh, desires, so I desire that P, uh, hopes, wishes, I wish that P, I hope that P, and so beliefs are really just affirming the truth or probable truth of some proposition or set of propositions. So a theist is someone who believes that God exists, an atheist is someone who believes that God doesn't exist, um, and within the camp of atheists, um, uh, a substantial portion of them are naturalists. And this actually gets quite tricky with respect to defining naturalism. So here are some of the, uh, the most popular or the best ones that uh, I've come across, the best definitions of, of what a naturalist really is or what naturalism really is. So the first one that's that's usually cited is, well, uh, neither God nor anything like God exists. Um, and, you know, there are some difficulties with this, like, well, what counts as anything like God? It's just not at all clear. It's not clear what anything like God, like what, what that quantifies over, right? I mean, like, it seems somewhat plausible that, you know, uh, a naturalist could be a substance dualist. I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that doesn't really seem to be anything too supernatural. I mean, most naturalists aren't going to be substance dualists, but I mean, they could at least be something like a property dualist. Yeah, so I don't know, like, what constitutes something being sufficiently like God so as to be debarred from the naturalist camp? It's difficult, but um, that's one way to get your mind around it. There's neither God nor anything like God, so nothing sort of supernatural beyond the, uh, the natural, uh, mundane uh, world. Um, so that's one way. The second way is uh, that, uh, sort of taken from Oppy, is that the only concrete things that exist are natural concrete beings with natural causal powers. Now, of course, you're probably thinking, well, hold on a second. You're trying to define naturalism or naturalist, and you're invoking the very concept of natural in your definition. What's with that? Well, Oppy, uh, he goes on to um, give various uh, precisifications of what he means by uh, natural. And uh, yeah, he, he goes through different accounts. So um, if you have beef with that, you can take it up with, with Dr. Oppie, not me. Uh, the next one is just that um, every concrete thing is either physical or ultimately explained by the physical. So that's Draper. Um, that's his account. Um, now, of course, there is the trouble of defining what physical is. Um, but this one is kind of helpful um, because this one actually allows there to be non-physical things. Um, non-physical properties or substances or what have you. It's just that their their ultimate basis, right, is going to be in terms, they're going to be explained ultimately in terms of more fundamental physical facts. Um, and so it's compatible with the existence of non-physical facts. It's just that they're going to bottom out in sort of um, physical facts. Uh, yeah, it's a sort of priority physicalism. That That's kind of how Draper would conceive of it. And then for me, I just kind of threw this one on the spot. Um, I think one of the best ways to characterize it is just, and again, this also has prop 
problems. All of these have, have problems, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to define these things. But the way that I define it is something like ultimate fundamental reality is non-mental and non-personal. Now what's difficult with that is that I haven't given any positive characterization of it, um, but you know, that, that's, I think that's probably a feature rather than a bug of it. It leaves open things like neutral monism, priority physicalism, other things. It's just that ultimate fundamental reality, whatever is ultimate, whatever is at the bedrock of reality, is just, it's non-mental. So it's not a mind, it's not a person, and it's not, it, yeah, it's impersonal. And then an agnostic, well, that was literally two slides back, so you can go back there and listen to that. Uh, and then an innocent is someone who just hasn't considered the question sufficiently to have any view at all. So people like babies or maybe, uh, I don't know, Amazonian tribesmen, I don't, I don't even know. Insofar as it makes sense to talk about them considering the question. I mean, it, it would probably be weird to say that a, a rock is an innocent, because, um, you know, they can't even consider the propositions in question. But, you know, I mean, uh, if you've ever come across those new atheist rocks, boy oh boy, they are difficult to deal with. Okay, so whenever we're talking about being an agnostic, it's always an agnostic towards some proposition. Or, uh, and, and in this case, I've specified that proposition as the proposition that God exists. But that, of course, raises the question concerning what model of God we're talking about. And to that end, I've briefly laid out different models of God on offer, or at least the prominent ones. And of course I break them down into the two camps, classical theism and non-classical theisms. So the first one, classical theism, uh, affirms what's sometimes called the big four. Um, uh, if, you're, if you're curious to hear more elaborations on each of these, I've, I've elaborated on them in, in much greater depth in a lot of other videos that I've done on my channel, specifically with, with Ryan Mullins uh, and so on. But essentially, uh, it affirms simplicity, so God is utterly non-composite, he doesn't have any physical or metaphysical parts, all of his properties and attributes are identical to one another and identical to God himself, uh, his essence and his existence are identical, and, and so on. Um, whatever God has, God is, whatever is in God, is God, things like that. Um, timelessness, and of course there are, there are slightly different ways to articulate um, each of these uh, attributes. So timelessness just means that God uh, exists uh, as it were outside of time. So uh, he exists without beginning, without end, without, success, without succession, without temporal duration or location or extension. And then immutability just means that God is utterly devoid of potentiality. Um, he cannot, he has no potential to change. He cannot change. Uh, he is unchangeable, purely actual, so on. Impassibility just means that uh, God doesn't suffer. Uh, he cannot be causally influenced by anything apart from himself. And yeah, he just, he exists in a sort of perfect, undisturbable blessedness or bliss or happiness. And of course, there are different flavors like uh, Thomistic, classical theism, Palamite, classical theism, Scotistic, classical theism, uh, and so on. Um, and these things, they have varying, varyingly strong conceptions of simplicity and, time, and timelessness and immutability and so on. The next kind of class is non-classical theisms. And so the first one is a sort of neoclassical theism or modified classical theism. For an introduction to this, you can see uh, Kevin Timpey, I believe that's how you pronounce it, Kevin, Kevin Timpey's article um, in, I think it's called Introduction to Neoclassical Theism. It is in, it's that book, it's that giant book that uh, Ryan Mullins held up in our discussion with him. It's something like Models of God and or alternative models of God and ultimate reality, something like that. Um, but it's this monolithic thousand-page book, but it's, it's got really valuable resources. So neoclassical theism rejects and or modifies one or more of the big four, and oftentimes all four of them, because um, oftentimes they're uh, kind of like a package deal. Um, neoclassical theism conceives of God as a sort of perfect being. He's metaphysically necessary. He creates and sustains everything, every concrete thing, at least apart from himself, ex nihilo. Um, there's this sort of distinction between God and creation. God has comprehensive and extensive foreknowledge of the future. Um, and most neoclassical theists hold to a kind of presentist ontology of time and an, on, and an endurantist theory of persistence through time. But, it, you know, it's, it's conceivable and possible in principle for a neoclassical theist to hold to different uh, models of time uh, and like different conceptions of persistence like perdurantism. Okay, so next up is panentheism. And so um, uh, panentheists, they share a lot in common with neoclassical theists, but they subtract a few things. So for instance, um, panentheism usually subtracts creation ex nihilo, and in its place substitutes creation ex deus. So um, creation is, a, is sort of um, an outpouring of God himself, or God sort of makes use of his own being, his own resources in creating, in creating the world. Um, it's Oftentimes, it can be a sort of concomitant with theistic idealism. Um, some panentheists think God is not free to create, um, but uh, you know that doesn't seem to be utterly essential to panentheism. Um, and then the basic the basic slogan for panentheism is just God is not identical with the universe. He's more than the universe, but the universe is in some sense contained within God. Something like that. So one way that Ryan Mullins articulates this is that um, the panentheist would be saying something like, um, 
uh, they make a distinction between metaphysical space and time and absolute space and time, um, and they would say that absolute space and time are to be construed as metaphysical space and time, uh, which are in turn divine attributes, whereas physical space and time are not. Um, and when God creates a universe, he creates uh, physical space and time, um, but those exist within metaphysical space and time, which in turn are attributes of God. So. Um, it's, it's a bit complicated, um, and I'll, I'll suggest to you a paper that you can read uh, concerning different models of God later on. Uh, I have that uh, linked in my presentation. Um, and then next up is pantheism. So pantheism denies that there is a plurality of substances that make up the world. While it appears that there's a plurality of substances, they oftentimes hold that this is kind of like an illusion. There's really only one substance. Um, Ted Peters explains it like, uh, uh, down deep, below the level of perception, all things are only one thing, and that one thing is the divine reality. Um, the one substance that exists is God, and all else is uh, either a mode or a manifestation of God. So that's pantheism. And then finally, open theism is essentially the same thing as um, neo -the neoclassical theism minus, minus comprehensive or extensi extensive divine foreknowledge of the future. Open theists are pretty much hardcore committed to presentism and endurantism, um, and they're really hardcore committed to libertarian freedom, and they're uh, committed to the claim that... Um, God is distinct from creation and so on, um, but what they'll say is that God's omniscience is not defined by knowing all true propositions, uh, since God doesn't know true propositions about the uh, the future, or at least uh, future human actions. Now, some of them actually say that God doesn't know these true propositions because they aren't in fact true, so they'll sort of, um, they'll reject the principle of bivalence, um, but that's getting a little bit too far ahead of ourselves for uh, present purposes. And of course, uh, you know, there are different methodologies for doing these things. The most popular is perfect being theism, uh, and then there's also sort of uh, process theism as a, as a kind of methodology. But um, we need not dwell on those now. Now, um, the question arises concerning what am I agnostic towards? Um, well, so for a class, you know, I broke this down into classical theism and non-classical theisms. So for classical theism, I'm probably best described as something like an atheist with respect to the classical theistic God, but a very tentative and moderate one, right? So um, perhaps an agnostic atheist is the best description. Um, so my confidence or epistemic credence in the non-existence of the classical theist God is something like 0.7 or 0.8, something along those lines. Again, these are these are rough numbers, um, and I'll be explaining why that is so, at least with respect to my mind, right? Again, this is all person-based. I mean, uh, with respect to my mind in this presentation, so hold your horses. Um, and then for non-classical theisms, um, I reject pantheism and open theism, but I'm agnostic towards uh, neoclassical theism and panentheism as models of God. And by agnostic, yeah, I, I definitely mean about or approximately something like 0.5 or half and half. Um, and again, uh, I'll be explaining why uh, throughout this video. That's the purpose of this video. And before going on, I want to give at least a framework that I like to use for evaluating arguments. So obviously I'm not going to be talking about all the arguments that one can level in this in this uh, presentation. Some of these arguments, I evaluate them in different ways than others, and I think that they succumb to different problems than others, right? So some of them might have certain undercutting defeaters, other, other ones I might think that they have good rebutting defeaters, still others I might think that they have neither undercutting or rebutting defeaters, but they have certain dialectical or Morian problems. And so what do I mean by these things? Well, first, um, it's useful to uh, break up uh, different ways to evaluate arguments um, in terms of undercutting defeaters. So that's the first one. And an undercutting defeater essentially removes justification uh, for a premise or an assumption of an argument. You're essentially sort of pulling the rug out from under someone um, or their argument and sort of removing the justification that they have, uh, showing it to be faulty or, you know, resting on some sort of uh, unjustified assumption or what have you. And then secondly, we have rebutting defeaters. And these show a premise or an assumption to be false. So not only do they remove justification or a uh, premise uh, of a premise, or an assumption, but they, they positively show the premise or assumption to be false, or likely false at least. And then the third one is a sort of dialectical uh, problem. Uh, and so that shows that the argument or an assumption of the argument uh, is dialectically ill-formed or unconvincing. So uh, this you're going to have to like take into account things like uh, what's the dialectical context at hand? Um, is a certain premise that uh, one party is helping themselves to? Is that premise question begging against the uh, detractors of the argument in this particular context? Uh, and so on. Uh, and there are other various dialectical um, deficiencies that can that can come up. Um, and this is where you really get to the distinction between sound arguments and convincing arguments. Um, and so you uh, to give a dialectical defeater, usually it's going to involve things like um, uh, question begging, but also it's going to be, uh, you know, unconvincing, dialectically ill-formed arguments and so on. Don't worry, I'll be doing videos on, on these uh, th these frameworks later, um, but I'm just trying to give you a sense of, of what I'm talking about. So the fourth one, then, is a sort of Morian, Morian defeater uh, for evaluating arguments, and that, that derives from the name um, 
from from GE Moore and he invented what is called the well what has come to be called the Morian shift and so you essentially you look at an argument but you have a bunch of separate other reasons for thinking that the conclusion is false um, and so what you essentially do is you don't even essentially tackle the arguments premises you just show the conclusion to be false and you can do uh, modus tollens and render at least one of the premises false right so you can infer the um, the the disjunction of the negations of each of the premises now that might seem a little complicated but again it's not my purpose really to go through these in depth here I'm going to do that in other videos uh, to come and again I, I think I already explained why I included this slide it's mainly because for some arguments that I either included or didn't include right um, it's it's not that I think that I have uh, you know for some of them at least uh, I won't have a rebutting or undercutting defeater I might have certain dialectical and Morian defeaters for them um, and and you know it also goes the other way around so um, yeah, hopefully this this uh, serves you. But now it's it's time to go into uh, looking at uh, what has sort of um, you know convinced me to think that classical theism has certain um, intellectual merits and has certain strengths. So I'll, let's go into that next. So again, I'm just breaking this down into classical theism and non-classical theisms. So right now we're just looking at um, distinctive arguments for and against classical theism that uh, again in my position on the epistemic landscape, I find uh, plausible on, on either or both sides, or what have you. And so the main one, and this is really a family of arguments, again, um, is what's called uh, explicability arguments. And they can be modalized, too, by introducing certain possibility operators, um, and then you'll get a, a possibility operator in the conclusion. So it's possible that God exists, and then, you know, you just use excuse me, the S5 axiom uh, to get that God actually exists. One general form that these, these types of arguments take uh, is, is seen on the slide, and so I'll, I'll work through this with you. So um, premise one of these kinds of arguments just says, for any fact F, probably F has some explanation, other things being equal, right? And this is just, this is, this is like a fundamental principle of intellectual inquiry, right? Like we look for explanations of things. Um, that's like, that's the whole point of being a philosopher, right? You're trying to give some story or some account of reality. You're trying to explain as much as you can, right? And so really, um, it, it seems plausible that for any fact F, probably F has some explanation, other things being equal. Now, of course, um, it's not always the case that other things are equal, right? So if we take the fact that everything exists, like you include the totality fact, it's just like everything, right? And assuming that that is a fact, um, this won't have some sort of explanation uh, because there's nothing beyond itself that could account for why it obtains. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, something inside of it is sort of already presupposing the existence of the fact, and the fact itself can't explain itself because that's sort of circular. It's viciously circular. And so by explanation, I'm sort of just stipulating um, a non-circular explanation. Um, and I discuss that in my... Um, in my devil's advocate debate with Randall Rouser, uh, I discuss uh, some of my stipulations on what I mean by explanation. And th those are the stipulations that are applying here. Um, and so, yeah, again, premise one says that for any fact F, F probably has some explanation, other things being equal. And then premise two says it is a fact that there are beings of type T. So you could say changeable beings, you could say composite beings, beings with essence, existence, distinctions, and so on. So we're just looking at uh, the type, right? So we're trying to uh, explain types. And so what follows from those two premises is that probably there are beings of type, uh, or sorry, probably that there are beings of type T has an explanation, other things being equal, right? Uh, but of course, the only thing that could explain why there are beings of type T, um, again, we're, we're, we're talking about changeable beings, composite beings, essence, existence, uh, distinction beings, and so on. The only thing that could explain why there are the beings of those of those types uh, is an unchangeable, absolutely simple being in which essence and existence are identical, right? Um, you can't cite a changeable being to explain uh, why the fact that there are beings of the type changeable being in the first place, right? Because you're, you're sort of presupposing the very thing you're trying to explain. If you're trying to explain the instantiation of the type changeable being, you cannot appeal to changeable beings. That, it, you know, that's, that's presupposing the very thing you're trying to give an account for uh, why it's in reality in the first place. And so, um, yeah, the only thing that could uh, explain why there are beings of type T is uh, an unchangeable, absolutely simple being. Um, and so probably what follows is that probably there is such a being, other things being equal. And then if it's probable that there is such a being, then it's probable that God exists. Again, because that's that's kind of just what classical theists mean by God. They just mean the unchangeable, absolutely simple reality in which essence and existence are identical that accounts for the the uh, the fact that there are beings of the other types, right? That's kind of just what they mean. Now, I am kind of skeptical of certain stage two inferences, um, especially getting to uh, the personal nature of such a being, like um, that it has intellect and will and so on. Um, but I'll do future videos on that, like stage two of... Uh, phasers, uh, Thomistic argument, and phasers, uh, Aristotelian proof.
because I have certain papers on these things. Um, but we won't get into that here. Let's just let's just stipulate that that's what God means. Um, and so what follows is that so probably God exists, other things being equal. And that is the distinctively classical theistic God, right? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I actually think that this argument is, well, this is going to sound weird to you guys, but I, I definitely think that this argument is sound, right? Um, it, it has all true premises and it's valid. But, you know, that, that doesn't commit me to classical theism because look at, look at the conclusion. It says, so probably God exists, other things being equal. And what I'm going to want to argue um, is that other things by no means are equal. <laughs> But this is definitely, this is at least some piece of evidential weight in favor of classical theism. Um, and yeah, and there are a bunch of different kinds of sort of explicability arguments. And so, um, yeah, definitely it's some evidential weight for classical theism. But as I said in the beginning, I'm probably best described as an atheist or at least an agnostic atheist with respect to classical theism. So let's get into some of the, um, d the distinctive arguments that at least I, from my own position on the epistemic landscape, have found plausible uh, 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 against classical theism. Okay, so before articulating um, some of these difficulties, uh, I do want to emphasize that I'm not going to be able to get through all of them because um, in, in, a, in a very literal sense there are um, dozens of, of distinct uh, arguments and predicaments and problems that arise. In fact, a philosopher friend of mine and I, uh, not Ryan Mullins, uh, but a, a philosopher friend and I are actually writing up a paper on two dozen or so sort of innovative and, and novel arguments against classical theism. And so, for instance, we're going to be looking at a host of arguments from different like categories, one of which, one of which is abstracta. So we're going to be looking at some really interesting and uh, like new work on Fragianism and Millianism about propositions, Russellianism and Lewisianism about propositions, Platonism, uh, other problems deriving from singleton sets, um, some really interesting interesting problems uh, and like innovative um, arguments against classical theism driving from various theses. Um, and that's just one category of arguments we'll be exploring. We'll also be exploring some other like really cool arguments pertaining to truth making, like truth supervenes on being, truth maker essentialism, etc., divine action, Trinitarianism, and so on. So lots of really cool arguments um, in there. And so when I say dozens, um, yeah, I mean that in the most literal sense. And then the se secondly, I want to say that um, all these are really sort of families of arguments. Um, so when I say alone worlds or aloneness arguments, um, I mean that as a sort of family of arguments. And then third, I want to repeat that I'm merely presenting these as arguments that I find personally convincing and or plausible, right? My purpose in this video is not, I'm going to repeat that, my purpose in this video is not to justify these. Um, for some, in fact, probably most, I'll just go through the arguments extremely briefly without any, you know, giving them any flesh or development. Uh, other videos of mine are for giving flesh, and those will be out in due time uh, in the future, and some of them have already been posted. Um, so don't scream or panic if I don't justify particular premises or address particular objections in this brief presentation. I know it's not brief right now, I'm already at like 34 minutes, but... <laughs> Stick with me. I hope you're enjoying this. Um, it's got some great content later on, too. So I hope you're on the edge of your seat. Um, so yeah, again, don't scream or panic if I don't justify particular premises or address particular objections in this brief presentation. That is not my purpose. And that also means, of course, that my primary aim here is not to convince, right? And so you can, I mean, you can comment uh, on the arguments I discuss in this video. But I mean, please know that I, I, I might not respond to the I might not respond on behalf of the arguments, right? Precisely because that's not the purpose of this video. As you know, uh, I respond on arguments' behalf in other videos um, occasionally. So, um, yeah, again, please keep in mind my purpose in making this video. Um, but with these notes out of the way, here are some of the things that influence my credence, credence uh, against classical theism. Okay, and so the first one I have listed there is alone worlds. Um, and so... Arguments in this category are kind of based on classical theism's commitment to the possibility that God exists alone, or possibly God exists without any non-God thing whatsoever. And this just follows from two central claims of classical theism, namely that things only have being insofar as God, who is being itself, creatively bestows being to them, and two, God is free to create or not create anything apart from himself. Okay, And so that's, that's really what the basis of all of these arguments. And then from that basis, you can um, you can look at a variety of different arguments and, and problems and puzzles that might arise. So one of them is just the aloneness argument. I have a different video on that that you can check that out. But like in its briefest form, it's basically saying that uh, under if classical theism is true, right, then God cannot have a contingent intrinsic feature. By feature, I just mean some sort of positive ontological item like uh, you know properties, accidents, forms, matter, essences, existences, and so on. Um, God cannot have any contingent intrinsic positive ontological item or feature. Um, but, premise two, right, God can have a contingent intrinsic feature, and so classical theism is false. That's the easiest way to present the, the kind of argument. Um, 
And so, I mean, clearly the, uh, the contentious premise is that uh, God can have a contingent intrinsic feature. But, you know, one way we might try to try to motivate this, and again, I'm just presenting what I find myself plausible. So um, I'm just, you know, presenting my kind of my kind of thoughts. And so basically, um, you know, in a world wherein God chooses not to create uh, any feature of God's is intrinsic to God, you know, um, he couldn't have any sort of extrinsic features, because then there, there's like literally nothing apart from him in such a world. Um, and hence, there's nothing to which God could relationally stand in such a world, which means he doesn't have any features that are completely extrinsic to him. Um, all that exists in such a world is God and what's intrinsic to him. And so but in a world where, of course, God chooses not to create, um, God contingently has some knowledge, right? Um, and this means that God contingently has some feature, like contingent knowledge. Um, uh, and other classical theists have even granted this, like uh, see William Matthews Grant uh, in his paper 2012. Um, he, he agrees that God contingently has some knowledge. And, and this is precisely what actually motivates him to take certain extrinsic models of divine knowledge. Um, and, you know, uh, what's interesting about the alone world is that those models won't be able to work in the alone world. Um, and so uh, since God is omniscient, right, God knows all truths. And since there are contingent truths in a world wherein God chooses not to create, um, for instance, God chooses not to create, like that's a contingent truth, or Earth doesn't exist, that's a contingent truth. Um, God only contingently has some of this knowledge. And so um, what follows is that uh, these features are, uh, or this knowledge is, is contingent, but it's also intrinsic to God, and hence God can have a contingent intrinsic feature. Um, and so uh, we get that um, God, it, there's some possible world in which God has a contingent intrinsic feature, uh, and that's just premise two, what I was... Um, uh, discussing earlier. And again, there are a variety of different responses to this. Uh, I don't claim that any of these things are, are decisive refutations or anything, right? Again, I'm just trying to present my own, like what I find plausible, um, what to my mind uh, seems, you know, what seems plausible, what has sort of affected my journey, right? Um, and so uh, I don't claim that these are insuperable or decisive or what have you. Um, and yeah, uh, if you're looking for just more information on this argument, uh, just check the aloneness argument video um, that I made a while back. Um, another thing that's uh, interesting with respect to alone worlds um, is that, so here's a, a very different, um, here's a different argument about the alone world um, that's, that's kind of interesting. Uh, but basically, um, we take the alone world, uh, and then we take um, what's called truth supervenes on being. It's a very kind of Aristotelian principle, which is just a, a difference in truth value across worlds concerning the contents of those worlds presupposes some difference in being across those worlds. Um, uh, yeah, so truth supervenes on being. That is to say, you can't have a difference in truth without having some sort of difference in the being or actuality of things, which is, um, yeah, it's it's a plausible principle that a, a number of philosophers, especially Aristotelian philosophers, uh, enjoy, um, you know, employing and, and using. Not all of them, of course, but um, but essentially then we just add that God can choose for different reasons to be alone, or at least different reasons can impress God differently for being alone. Um, and that, that seems like, uh, you know, that seems reasonably plausible, right? I mean, like, what would, get, what would, like, force God to act on one and only one set of reasons to be alone? And what would force God to be impressed by, to the exact degrees to which he is impressed by the reasons for being alone? So essentially, uh, it seems entirely possible for there to be two distinct alone worlds in which uh, God chooses for different reasons to be alone. Um, what that follows is that there are differences in truth value across such worlds concerning the contents of those worlds, and by the principle of truth supervenes on being, there must be some sort of difference in being or actuality across these worlds. Um, and so, uh, but if classical theism is true, right, there cannot be any difference in being across the alone worlds precisely because God's the only thing in those worlds, and so there would have to be some sort of difference in being concerning God's being. Um, God would have some sort of contingent feature like that. Um, and hence, um, uh, given all these premises, it would fall that classical theism is false. And again, there are different ways to avoid this. You can clearly just deny truth supervenes on being. Uh, you can also say that, you know, uh, there's only one possible alone world that God must uh, must choose to be alone for one and only one set of reasons, and he must be impressed to the exact degrees to which he is impressed in the alone world for being alone. Um, uh, concerning those reasons. Again, there are different ways to get out of these uh, types of arguments. Uh, but, you know, I'm just sketching different different uh, lines of argumentation that are, are interesting. And again, I'm still on this alone worlds section. Um, so uh, another another interesting thing is that, um, uh, consider again the alone world. So this is a, this is a sort of third uh, argument from alone worlds um, that is sort of, uh, you know, I think is kind of plausible, right? So because God is the only reality in the alone world, like reality as such is wholly actual, right? There's no potency in reality whatsoever. Um, I mean, suppose that there were some potency, well, then this potency would either be intrinsic to God or extrinsic to God, um, but uh, it can't be intrinsic to God because God is utterly devoid of potency. He's purely actual. And it can't be 
excuse me, it can't be extrinsic to God, right? Because God doesn't create anything extrinsic to him in the alone world. And hence, um, there couldn't exist some sort of potency distinct from God in the alone world that's, in, that's extrinsic to him. There isn't some sort of realm of potentiality apart from God that he doesn't create. And so what we get is that um, the alone world, the contents of the alone world, there's no potency in there. It's just purely actual. Uh, reality as such is wholly actual in the alone world. Um, now, uh, well, of course, one might object here that, like, you might distinguish between passive and active potency, right? Like, so although uh, passive potency doesn't exist in the alone world, active potency, right, in the form of God's, like, active causal power or capacity does, and hence a certain potency exists in the alone world. That's one response, but um, uh, at least to my mind, it doesn't really seem uh, extremely convincing, right? Because active potencies are not potentialities, but are instead a kind of actuality. I mean, um, Phaser on page 43, I think it is, of his uh, book, Scholastic Metaphysics, explicitly states, quote, active potency is, strictly speaking, a kind of act or actuality, um, end quote. And moreover, uh, nothing can be both actually existent and potentially existent, and active potencies are actually existent, and hence they aren't potencies, right? Uh, they can't serve as the uh, the locus uh, for, the, for the potencies in question. But uh, what this means, right, is that um, like relative uh, to the alone world, right, different possible worlds are still possible relative the, to the alone world, right? So um, for instance, the actual world, the one that you and I are in right now, um, is possible relative to the alone world, and hence there are there are whole hosts of unrealized possibilities in the alone world, but yet there are no potencies in the alone world. And so what follows is that unrealized possibilities are not potencies, and that, that seems to contradict a fundamental tenet of uh, Aristotelianism uh, with respect to act and potency and with respect to um, the metaphysics of modality, right? Um, under under certain plausible forms of Aristotelianism, um, reality is just fundamentally divided into act and potency, and potency corresponds to unrealized possibilities. Um, but the classical theist is going to have to deny that, um, because there are unrealized possibilities in the alone world, uh, but yet there are no potencies in the alone world. Um, and there are there are a bunch of different uh, you know ways you might respond to that, and ways you are, you can actually respond to those responses. But again, I'm just giving a sort of brief overview. Um, and so there are a bunch of different arguments uh, that, that pertain to the alone world. Um, but uh, for now, let's just go on to, um, let's go on. To, I'm going to skip that uh, truth and truth making one. I'll, I'll not skip it, but I'll, I'll place it after the abstracta one. So let's move on to abstracta. Um, so with respect to abstracta, we might argue something like, uh, if classical theism is true, then the existence of any X distinct from God presupposes God's freely creating X. And so then we might think that anything distinct from God is uh, thereby contingent, right? Because it would presuppose God's creating it, but God is free to create it. Um, but then we would think that um, there are necessarily existing abstracta, right? Like um, certain propositions are necessarily true and hence necessarily existent, right? Because something can't be true unless it exists. Um, and hence uh, we might think, and abstracta moreover are distinct from God. And so we might think that, well, there are necessarily existent things distinct from God, but yet under classical theism, there can't be such necessarily existing things distinct from God because anything distinct from God requires God's uh, creative and free bestowal of being to it. Um, and so that's that's one problem. And again, like I'm saying, like I want to emphasize throughout this whole thing, I don't claim that any of these are insuperable. I don't claim that any of these uh, rationally force someone to believe in something. I think that there are ways to get uh, to avoid these arguments. Um, one can be rational in disagreeing with these arguments. I also think one can be perfectly rational in accepting these arguments. Um, and there are responses to the, uh, these arguments. There are counter responses to those responses and so on, right? Um, the inquiry is the inquiry is unending, and that's what's so beautiful about it, really. Um, so then, uh, you know, some other some other interesting things that uh, derive from abstracta are uh, we might think we might take a sort of theistic conceptualist route that many classical theists like to do. So um, we might think that uh, a true proposition has the property of truth, right? So long as we're not deflationists, with which a lot of classical theists aren't, they like the correspondence theory of truth, as do I. Um, they think that uh, a true proposition has the property of truth, right? Um, but under classical theism, properties are parts of things. This is precisely why they deny that God has a multiplicity of distinct properties, uh, because properties are conceived of as parts. Uh, and see, you know, see the entire classical tradition in affirming this. I also see like uh, contemporary philosophers that explicitly hold this, like Catherine Rogers and um, another classical theist that emphasized this. Um, but what we get is that if we're theistic conceptualists, we think that true propositions are intrinsic to God, but we also think that true propositions have the property of truth, and we also think that properties are parts, and hence there are things that are intrinsic to God that have parts, um, which is which is quite weird, right? Uh, we might think that it's a very plausible principle of, uh, of uh, Mariology, that if x is intrinsic to y, and x has parts, well then y is not utterly simple, right? Like y would thereby have parts. Um, yeah, so that seems to be a, a pretty plausible principle of Mariology. Um, so that, that's another kind of problem that we might uh, think up with respect to abstracta. Um, and there are different uh, other problems like uh, Rossellianism, possible worlds theories of, of propositions, um, 
and, and so on. Singleton sets, that one's really interesting, uh, and so on. But now I, uh, I'll go on to uh, truth and truth making uh, for the next kind of batch of arguments. Well, essentially, um, there are some really plausible um, principles within truth and truth making, like for instance, truth supervenes on being that I was just talking about earlier that might pose problems for classical theism. Also, truth maker essentialism, which is uh, just that uh, if X serves as a truth maker for um, for Y, well then um, X is thereby essentially a truth maker of Y. That is to say, um, if X obtains, then it thereby, in all, all worlds in which X obtains, it makes Y true. So for instance, if we think that um, grass is genuinely instantiating the property of greenness, if we think that 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 state of affairs, grass is being green, is a truth maker for the proposition that grass is green. Well then, um, under this truth maker essentialism principle, uh, we would say that, well then, that state of affairs is essentially um, a truth maker for the proposition. That is to say, in any world in which that state of affairs obtains, the proposition is thereby true. Um, and so, you know, that, that also seems plausible. I mean, like, how could it, ob how could the first obtain without the second being true, right? Like, how could it obtain that grass genuinely, truly instantiates the property of being green like how could how could it be the case that grass grass is in fact green, without the proposition grass is green being true? Like uh, it seems it seems very very plausible uh, this truth maker essentialism, but once we get truth maker essentialism on board, we get uh, a variety of different problems for for classical theism, uh, and so you know we might think that there are various um, uh, true, contingent, intrinsic predications of God in the alone world, for instance, concerning. God's God's providential and free choices, right? Um, I mean, these are true predications of God, like God freely chooses not to create. Um, you know, it's not a predication about something apart from God, because there's nothing apart from God in the alone world. So this one is kind of mixing up truth and alone worlds, I know. Um, but, so, yeah, it seems to be a contingent uh, predication about God in the alone world. Um, a contingent true predication of God in the uh, in the alone world. Um, and if we, if we take on board... Um, truth maker essentialism, uh, that's, that, that's just not possible. It's not possible that um, God serves as the truth maker for something that it is only contingently true. Because God is, of course, necessarily obtaining, and hence if he serves as the truth maker for something, then since truth makers are essentially truth makers of the things that they make true, it follows that the thing that God makes true is necessary. Um, yeah, so it wouldn't be possible for there to be a contingent uh, true predication uh, solely about uh, about God or a contingent true imprin intrinsic predication of God uh, in the alone world if we uh, accept truth maker essentialism. Again, there are different ways to flesh out this argument. Uh, I'm just going off like the top of my head with a lot of these, right? So um, you're going to have to forgive certain uh, kind of uh, scattered presentations of these arguments and so on. Um, I'm just trying to give you a, a glimpse a glimpse into some of these problems. Um, again, each of these could, really each of these could, could warrant and, uh, you know, like a 5,000 word paper on, on every single one of the arguments. And so, um, yeah, so uh, definitely uh, keep that in mind as I'm uh, presenting these sorts of things. Okay, so let's move on to like explanatory arguments. So these arguments kind of um, take issue with God's explanatory relation or lack thereof with creation under classical theism. So um, I think his name is Omar Fakhri. Um, that's F-A-K-H-R-I. I think I, I probably spelled that wrong. But he's got a forthcoming paper in the European Journal for Philosophy of Religion where he is essentially um, using what's called the explanatory difference principle. Um, but he's using it in a way uh, as a sort of... Um, as a sort of evidence for neoclassical theism over classical theism. And he's not really arguing that um, the explanatory difference principle is true. He's just arguing that um, it poses an expl a, a strong explanatory disadvantage for classical theism in explaining uh, differences in creation or that... Um, that classical or that neoclassical theism doesn't have, and he uh, he also tackles the sort of two quoque objections, like oh well, um, you know the 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 neoclassical theist also has a problem explaining different divine choices coming to be from uh, a, a divine essence that's utterly the same across all possible worlds. He goes into the nature of reasons and reason-based explanations and what's called the justificatory relation um, in order to avert that problem. It's a really interesting paper. Yeah, and it's forthcoming, so it should be out sometime soon, but definitely keep your eyes out uh, for that. But that's one that's one kind of line of argument. We might take a sort of um, explanatory difference principle argument. I guess I should specify that the explanatory difference principle states that um, differences in uh, the explanandum, that is what is to be explained, um, presuppose some sort of difference in the uh, explanands that account for, for those differences. And there are different ways we might motivate that. Um, but uh, he kind of uh, Omar takes it. Uh, he doesn't really argue that that is a an, an, like a, a devastating problem for classical theism. He says that it poses a very big explanatory burden uh, on it. So it's really interesting. Um, and there are there are different arguments along these lines. We might think that uh, 
the fundamental insight of the explanatory difference principle is a sort of problem maybe for divine providence under classical theism, right? So under classical theism, right, God remains utterly unchanged uh, across all possible worlds. And so God doesn't do anything distinctive in one world that accounts for why an infinite multiverse obtains uh, as opposed to doing anything distinctive uh, in the alone world as to why the alone world obtains, right? So um, I really think uh, it, would, it helps to kind of compare a world in which God coexists with an infinite multiverse with a world in which God um, coexist with nothing apart from himself, right? So for classical theists, there isn't anything distinctive that God did in one world as opposed to the other to ensure that one of the creations uh, obtained as opposed to the other, right? Um, and that we might think that that kind of uh, poses a difficulty for divine providence over creation. It's difficult to see how God would um, control which precise creation obtains as opposed to another creation if he doesn't do anything distinctive in one world as opposed to the other to make it be the case or to bring it about that um, one of the, the creations obtains. Um, and all of his reasons, all of his intrinsic states, all all of his causality, everything about him, even his relations to creation, right? Because he doesn't have any real relations to creation. The relations are only on the part of creation, right? So uh, it's sort of coming too late, as it were, in the explanatory order. Um, we might think that these pose a variety of problems for um, divine providence and God's providential governance and control over which precise creation obtains. Um, and so that's another kind of um, line of argument uh, in addition to the sort of explanatory difference principle. There's also a modified explanatory difference principle, uh, but you know I won't really get into that. Suffice it to note for now that there are a lot of interesting explanatory arguments that, um, at least to my mind, right, um, that personally have, have convinced me and, and uh, forced me to rethink uh, my, my assessments of classical theism and uh, yeah, um, to lean against classical theism. So. Uh, let's next move on to non-eternalism. Okay, so actually, I'll be, as, I'll be as brief as I can here because um, I went over this argument in my latest discussion with Brian Mullins on my channel. Um, but it's, it's essentially the argument that has convinced a lot of neoclassical theists to become neoclassical theists. So, for instance, William Lane Craig mounts this argument. Brian Mullins mounts it. Um, Josh Rasmussen finds it uh, really, really plausible. Um, and so on. So essentially, you just take a dynamic theory of time or some non-eternalist uh, theory of time, um, and you essentially say, like, listen, uh, if that if that account of time is correct, well, then temporal actualities sort of dynamically change. Uh, what is actual simpliciter genuinely changes over time. Um, and then we just say, well, if that's true, well, then truths concerning uh, temporal actualities genuinely change their truth value, and hence anything that knows such truths is, is such that um, its knowledge of such truths is going to have to change uh, in conjunction with the truths of chaining, right? Because knowledge presupposes truth, and hence if the truth changes um, from genuinely going from being true to false or false to true, uh, your knowledge, if you're truly omniscient, you're going to have to sort of track that, and so your knowledge is going to have to change as well. But you, we might plausibly argue um, that if classical theism is true, well, then God's knowledge cannot change, right? Because it would either be an intrinsic change or an extrinsic change, and uh, God cannot intrinsically change under classical theism, and moreover, um, uh, God doesn't stand in any relations whatsoever with creation, so it's not as though he can, you know, sort of uh, change his relations with creation and his relations with such dynamic facts, and so it seems as though um, there there wouldn't be any uh, intrinsic or extrinsic change that could account for this. Now, of course, you might take, like, a sort of very radical extrinsic model of divine knowledge, um, but then as we, uh, as I discussed with Mullins in, in my, um, uh, in my discussion with him, it seems as though we're going to be creeping towards uh, a sort of anti-realism with respect to with respect to divine knowledge of these changing actualities. Again, there are there are a whole host like this raises so many issues, and and one of the responses that Brian Left Out, for instance, raises is um, holding that actuality or existence is relative to a reference frame or relative to perspective. So all of time exists for God, but not all of time exists for us. Um, I mean, personally, I don't, I don't find, I don't find that plausible. But again, I'm just, I'm trying to give you maybe one way that a classical theist might respond, and some have responded. So yeah, I, I also find that that plausible that argument from non-eternalism. Um, and again, <laughs> I, I've, I've reiterated this so many different times. But um, this is all about, right? This is all about me, right? <laughs> the, it, I mean, obviously, I'm here to serve you, right? But this is all about my position on the epistemic landscape and what I have found plausible. Again, I'm not trying to make you. Uh, a non-classical theist. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to. You know, convince you right now. I'm just trying to. Um, you know, expose why I myself uh, hold the the positions that I do. Um, for now, I'll skip that Aristotelian modality thing. Um, and let's look at certain theological problems. So one theological problem derives from uh, a thesis that many level against ontic structural realism. So ontic structural realism is a position in the philosophy of science um, concerning the sort of fundamental 
nature of physical reality, or even lack thereof. Um, so ontic structural realism says that um, it's just it's just structure all the way down, right? Uh, it's just relations. It's just sort of mathematicized relations uh, all the way down um, uh, in terms of uh, the fundamental bits of physical reality. There aren't these there aren't these discrete elements with intrinsic natures and characters uh, at the fundamental level of physical uh, natural reality. Instead, it's just uh, relations. It's just structure. And so without getting into much more depth, I know I didn't explain it perfectly, but uh, without getting into much more detail on ontic structural realism, uh, a lot of philosophers find ontic structural realism very implausible. And one reason is because they think that relations, ultimately relations presuppose relata, that to stand in such relations, right? So you can't have a sort of relation of, uh, like, I don't know, being left of. Like, you can't just have that sort of just, like, there in reality without there being um, two things to stand in such relations, at least within concrete reality. Again, we're talking about the sort of physical world. We're not really talking about Plato's realm of forms. We're talking about the physical world. And so they think that relations presuppose um, non-relational things. Um, uh, or they think that you can't just have a sort of infinitely descending chain of relations upon relations upon relations with, upon relations without ultimately uh, grounding that, as it were, in non-relational things or non-relational individuals or attributes or whatever. Um, but if we take that fundamental insight um, and we apply it to uh, Trinitarianism, well, we might think that relations presuppose non-relational items as relata. Um, but uh, the Trinitarian relations, right, of begetting, of, um, you know, these eternal processions, like the Father begets the Son, the Father and the Son um, spirate the Spirit, right, um, and so on, right? These are irreflexive, right? Like, if X is begotten by Y, well, then it cannot be the case that Y is also begotten by X. And this is this is just part and parcel of conciliar Trinitarianism. Um, but if relations presuppose non-relational items as relata, and the Trinitarian relations are irreflexive, right, then there's just a, it just follows that there's a multiplicity of non-relational items within God. Um, but if the doctrine of divine simplicity is true, then there isn't a multiplicity of non-relational items within God, and hence, under, under this kind of argument, um, divine simplicity is false. Now, uh, of course, there, you know, there are different ways to reject this. Probably the classical theist is just going to reject that uh, relations presuppose non-relational items as relata. But then... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because now we're going to get into to debates about ontic structural realism uh, and whether relations ultimately do presuppose relata. But this is just one one uh, plausible argument that, that uh, my mind finds plausible, and there are different ways to go back and forth on uh, justifying the, the different premises. Um, so that that's one of the that's one of the sort of theological problems. Um, I guess I'll just go over maybe two more here. Um, so what, we might think that uh, another problem derives from the fact that um, both the Trinitarian Godhead and each of the three persons have one and the same divine nature or essence, right? That, that, seems, that seems at least to be, uh, you know, core to conciliar Trinitarianism, right? But then once we grant that, right, like the Trinitarian Godhead is essentially Trinitarian, right? Um, it's not like accidentally Trinitarian or anything. Like, it is of the very essence of the Trinitarian Godhead to be Trinitarian. Um, and by Trinitarian, I just mean um, there exist uh, three persons within it, right? Um, being... S is one entity or item in three persons. And so what we get is that both the Trinitarian Godhead and each of the three persons have one and the same divine nature or essence, right? But the Trinitarian Godhead is essentially Trinitarian, but each of the three divine persons is not essentially Trinitarian. Why? Because, well, each of the three divine persons, they're, they're not one entity in three persons, right? <laughs> if that were the case, well, then you'd actually have three times three, nine persons, right, within, within the Trinity, right? So it's, it's not the case that... Um, each of the three persons is essentially Trinitarian. Um, but if X and Y have one and the same nature or essence, well then X is essentially F, if and only if Y is essentially F, right? Um, uh, if, if they have an identical nature, well then something can't be essentially one thing while the other one is essentially not that thing, right? Um, and so what we get is that uh, it's simply false that, well, one of these, one of these assumptions is false. Um, and, you know, they all seem to be part and parcel of... Um, conciliar Trinitarianism in conjunction with uh, divine simplicity. But again, like I said, um, none of these things are insuperable. None of them are decisive. Again, uh, there are different ways to go about thinking about these problems and, and so on. Um, yeah, I've actually been in correspondence with uh, Tim Paul, um, Dr. Tim Paul, who works a lot on conciliar Trinitarianism and conciliar Christology on this kind of kind of argument. Um, and then the, the final theological problem that I've, I'm just going to mention, again, there are a lot, lot more, but one of them is just a, an interesting one about um, incarnation and proper parts. So um, uh, one, one commitment of classical theism, really, is that uh, if suppositum s, and by suppositum we just mean individual, right? So if, if, if the individual, or if the whole s is distinct from its nature, 
n, then n is a part of s, right? This is precisely why um, Aquinas goes through in in his uh, in the prima pars of the Summa Theologiae, right? He goes through and he says that can there in God be a distinction between suppositum and essence or nature? No, because that would imply composition, right? Um, and so uh, this this premise, if suppositum s is distinct from its nature, right, then the nature is part of s. But Christ, as a suppositum, right, as a as a single thing, is distinct from his divine nature, right? Like God isn't utterly identical to his divine nature, right? I mean, Christ can can uh, eat things, and uh, his divine nature uh, cannot. Um, but the divine nature, uh, or what follows from those two, is that uh, the divine nature is part of Christ. But God is identical to the divine nature under classical theism, and hence God is a part of Christ. But if classical theism is true, God cannot be a part of anything, and hence classical theism is false. That's the kind of the general line of argument. Now, um, as to why God cannot be part of anything under classical theism, well, uh, first of all, it kind of does havoc with Aristotelianism. So under Aristotelianism, parts are um, ontologically less fundamental than their wholes, but God cannot be ontologically less fundamental than anything. Moreover, parts exist only virtually and hence in potency under Aristotelianism. Um, whereas God is purely actually can't exist in potency. Uh, moreover, um, at least if we're trying to argue from comp composite being to God, right? Uh, most people, or most classical theists are going to argue that composite things require sustaining causes, but one of the very parts of S cannot efficiently cause S, right? Um, that would sort of already, it would already presuppose S's existence and hence, and hence cannot bring S's very existence into being. A, a part of S cannot efficiently cause S, right? Like my arm cannot bring me into being, right? It's being my arm sort of already presupposes that I'm in being. So my arm cannot efficiently cause my own existence. But uh, then we get that God efficiently causes everything distinct from himself, including Christ as such, and hence we get that a part of S cannot efficiently cause S, but God's a part of Christ, but yet God causes Christ. So we get this uh, contradictory, uh, or this paradox here. This does seem to be an interesting uh, theological argument. Um, and again, uh, I want to emphasize that these things aren't um, you know, decisive, and there are various ways to to go about uh, responding to them. I guess, okay, fine, I lied. Maybe here's one other theological uh, problem or argument. Um, we might think that if God stands in no real relations with people, well then, um, or if X stands in no real relations with Y, right, then X and Y plausibly cannot communicatively interact. Um, they cannot uh, sort of interactively converse or communicate with things, uh, with one another. That seems to, at least in some sense, require some sort of a real relation, right? I mean, logical relations are literally things that are only in our minds, right? Um, I mean, if I'm just like thinking about Socrates, um, that that plausibly that isn't some sort of a you know, that couldn't, that just couldn't be. It's not the kind of thing that could constitute uh, genuine interactive communication uh, and conversation with Socrates if it's just a completely logical relation between me and Socrates, right? And so if we think that that's the case, right, and again, like the classical theist can ultimately deny this, but uh, again, it's the, the, the purpose is sort of just to, to raise the price tag in my mind of classical theism, because that plausible, that, or that principle seems plausible. Um, the classical theist would have to deny that, it seems, because God plausibly, um, not plausibly, but in fact, the scriptures depict God as genuinely uh, interactively communicating with people like Moses and interactively conversing with his, with his people and so on. Um, and so uh, that's just, uh, that's, that's one way to, to think about it. Um, and again, uh, you know, as I've, as I've repeatedly emphasized, like these things aren't meant to be insuperable, decisive problems. Um, universal causality and free will, that's the next one. Um, I'll just be short. Basically, um, the, the the kind of causation we're talking about with God under classical theism is a sort of per se causation, right? So in that in chains of per se causes, all the non-fundamental members have their causality, all their causality um, with respect to the fundamental member. They have it in a they have it in a wholly derivative and instrumental manner. They are, as it were, instruments of the first cause. Um, but it's it's very unclear how something that has its, uh, you know, its power, all of its causal powers, like us, you, me, uh, other free, quote-unquote, free agents, it's, it's unclear how we could be free in the sense of, you know, um, being the ultimate originator or source of our actions if we are, uh, if, if our causal powers, the requisite causal powers in question, are wholly derivative uh, in that manner and wholly instrumental upon God's causality, right? Instruments are such that um, the, the primary member works through them, right? And so... Um, they don't have the causality of themselves, um, and so it's this, this it's this wholly derivative and instrumental nature that might lead us to think that um, that poses a problem for free will. Um, and of course, I know William Matthews Grant has his book uh, Divine Causality and Human Freedom. I think that's what it's called, or maybe no, it's Universal Divine Causality and Human Freedom, um, and so on. So again, uh, the debate here uh, can definitely go on and so on. But I'm just uh, I'm just trying to articulate what I find plausible. The next one is uh, existential inertia. So in uh, various papers of mine, I offer 
different arguments in favor of existential inertia, um, but also existential inertia as an undercutting defeater for a lot of um, a lot of uh, different natural theological arguments. Um, so that's one thing that's sort of uh, convinced me. Uh, I won't really belabor that point too much. And of course, there are many, many, many more along these lines. Uh, and so I won't really uh, explore them all in, in too much depth further on. But I just want to give you guys uh, just a general sense of, you know, what influences my beliefs, what, in, what, you know, accounts for where I am on the epistemic landscape. And again, this is for mutual understanding. It's for mutual perichoresis. It's so really that you and I, can really increase our love with one another so that I can serve you um, and you can serve me in turn, right? So that we can understand each other. It's not to uh, beat each other on the head. It's not to try to, you know, convince someone to uh, to adopt a, a certain tribal or camp position or anything. Nothing like that. So yeah, hopefully hopefully this section served you. Let's move on to uh, certain things that I need um, more exploration in. So among other things, I definitely need to look into further uh, biblical arguments and or theological arguments on both sides um, of this debate. I definitely also need to research in more detail constituent and relational ontologies. Um, I definitely need to look into uh, the nature of existence more. Um, so like, what is existence? What precisely are we talking about when we're saying existence? And that's what I actually have this. Um, this is on my reading list. It's, it's coming up somewhere on my reading list. But uh, Peter Van Inwagen, um, Existence, Essays, and Ontology, um, definitely uh, an interesting book, and um, he talks about constituent and relational ontologies in there. He talks about the nature of existence and so on. I mean, I also need to look at um, sort of neo-Aristotelian and contemporary essentialism versus the kind of traditional essentialism uh, that, you know, people like uh, Aristotle and Aquinas espoused. Um, and these are just things that I need more exploration in. It's not that I haven't explored these, um, but yeah, I definitely need more exploration. I have read uh, Real Essentialism by David Oderberg on this last point, um, but you know, one book won't be enough uh, for me. I'm going to have to you know, look into it further. This is just uh, um, the table of contents for uh, Peter Van Inwagen's book, so if you want to pause it, look at that. Maybe you can get interested in that book, and yeah. Um, and then to close off this section on classical theism, I still have neoclassical theism to get through, but it probably won't be as long as I just did there because, you know, obviously my research interests are in classical theism, so, you know, I'm kind of I'm kind of biased towards talking about that more. Before you ask, uh yes, uh I'm I, I have considered Edward Fazer's five proofs in extremely significant detail. I'm not convinced by um any of them. Uh I mean, if I I think that his contingency argument is plausible and interesting. Um um, Joe, just delete that, delete that last section, but, so, I mean, at least, at least at present, I have, um, six papers under review, they're each around 10k, right, words, so that's like, uh, 60,000 words, um, and that's on the Aristotelian proof stages one and two on existential inertia, to mystic proof with Oppie, that one's co-authored with Oppie. And then I have one paper under construction right now, which is on the Neoplatonic proof, which is his second proof, that's the argument from composition, and then I also have... I, my plan is to get two more in, um, one on the Augustinian and one on the rationalist proofs. So I basically have addressed all of them. Um, and then among other projects too, like these aren't clearly, clearly these aren't my other, my only papers. I, I, I also try to research in other areas like metaphysics, causal finitism, um, yeah, persistence and other things. Um, yeah, models of God and so on. So, um, yeah, but let's move on to non-classical theism. Okay, so the two most plausible versions, as I said at the beginning, of, of non-classical theism are neoclassical theism and panentheism. Uh, henceforth, I'll just call non-classical, I'll, I'll call both of these just theism, right? I, I think that neoclassical theism is the most plausible, um, but panentheism is definitely interesting. I do, th I do take very seriously uh, proposals uh, along the lines of creation ex deus, um, and, you know, that might be motivated by Philippe Elion's argument for material causality that, that uh, I'll touch on later. Um, and I, I just include this, this, this is the paper that I was talking about earlier on Models of God. It's very, very useful. The Difficulty of Demarcating Pantheism by R.T. Mullins, or Ryan Mullins. Um, yeah, he might be, he might be a little triggered that I'm, I'm including panentheism in here as something that, you know, is, is somewhat plausible as a form of theism to my mind, just because it's, it's, it's difficult to demarcate or distinguish or disambiguate, uh, <laughs> panentheism from neoclassical theism on the one hand and from pantheism on the other. Uh, it, it's a little bit difficult, but, um, yeah, anyway, uh, let's move on to um, what I find plausible about theism. So it's important to note first that the arguments are varyingly strong, to my mind, uh, both for and against theism, right? So not all of these, I don't attach the same strength to each of these. So the first family of arguments is just contingency arguments, and there are different modal contingency arguments, there are different different kinds. Um, there are, you know, I, I do find uh, at least 
at least a number of the ones contained within the book Necessary Existence by Alexander Proust and Josh Rasmussen, I do find at least a number of those of those plausible. Yeah, so uh, those would get us to some sort of metaphysically necessary entity that accounts for some feature of reality, usually, or possibly accounts for some feature of reality, oftentimes contingency or maybe possibly uh, the possible beginning of contingency or, or whatever. And so, yeah, those are interesting. Uh, now, as we'll, as I'll talk about later, usually where I get off the boat is uh, stage two of such arguments. But at least, you know, these these definitely pull on my mind in some in some way towards theism. The next one is causal finitism. So um, there are just lots and lots of paradoxes of infinite causal chains. I touched on at least some of them in my video, some paradoxes of infinity. So definitely check that that video out. But yeah, there are just lots and lots of puzzles, and it does seem that the, the simplest, most unifying, most explanatorily powerful account um, or solution to all these paradoxes that kills all of them from the get-go is causal finitism. That is, every uh, chain of causes is finite. Uh, has a, Every event or substance has a finite causal history. If that's the case, well then we swiftly get to some sort of uncaused uh, at least one uncaused first cause. And again, we might plausibly think that contingent things have some sort of deeper, more fundamental explanation. And so if something is uncaused, doesn't have some sort of like further explanation that, that accounts for why it's in reality, then it would be necessary. And so this, again, we're going to get into stage two worries, but at least causal finitism does incline me towards theism in some respect. Uh, another argument that inclines, or a family of arguments, I guess, um, uh, is, is sort of evolutionary debunking arguments. There are some some plausible responses to these, but these are these are things that, you know, kind of plausibly move my mind uh, towards theism in some regard. Um, and so what is an evolutionary debunking argument? Well, it's essentially taking the facts of evolution uh, in conjunction with uh, some sort of uh, epistemic principle, uh, and then arguing on that basis that we don't have knowledge in some domain. So what I'm really thinking about is evolutionary debunking of moral realism under the conjunction of naturalism and evolution, right? So, I mean, if, if naturalism is true, well, then it seems as though we easily could have evolved different moral faculties, different moral intuitions, uh, and so on. Some animals, they like eat their kin and they like cannibalize their dead and they like, they do really horrible things that like if humans were to do them with one another, we would, we would with our current faculties, we would think that they're just egregious and horrible. Um, but like, you know, it does seem plausible that like evolution easily could have gone some other way. Uh, like, it, you know, the evolutionary factors and selection pressures shaping our development easily could have been different such that we would have as a species done all these things that we now with our current faculties regard as horrendously immoral, but we would have uh, if we evolved differently, we would have regarded them as noble and glorious and beautiful and so on. And yeah, just really good. It's it's hard to see what principled relevant difference there is between our current epistemic uh, cognitive faculties, our moral faculties, and our, our nearby possible world counterparts that have completely different <laughs> moral faculties, right? Like, um, it would just seem to be arbitrary to, um, you know, to uh, prefer our own faculties and say that our own ones track the truth perfectly and theirs don't, right? Um, and so it, it does seem, you know, it, at least in some sense, to remove our confidence, um, or so the argument goes, it removes our confidence in our, in our acceptance of moral realism and our acceptance of the various moral beliefs that we do in fact have. Um, but, so the argument goes, we do have moral knowledge, and hence the conjunction of evolution and naturalism is false. Um, and of course, uh, you know, nat evolution is true, so they, you know, it would, it would be an argument against naturalism. Um, and you know, how would theism solve this? Well, plausibly, God would be able to direct our cognitive faculties to develop in such a way that are truth-tracking in order to facilitate good relationships with God, good relationships with one another, for our best flourishing, and so on. And again, uh, you know, these aren't, these aren't decisive arguments for theism. There are various responses, but that's another thing that sort of pulls me towards theism in some regard. So um, fine-tuning is definitely uh, interesting. Um, you know, fine-tuning is also a sort of uh, family of arguments, and I'm actually kind of interested in, like, a priori fine-tuning arguments. So basically, like, just intuitively, it seems that there are many more ways that the world could be chaotic and random uh, than it could be, like, orderly and stable and, you know, like, structurally uh, integrated. Um, yeah, as a sort of integrated, uh, as a sort of integrated whole that has its various parts working together and like mathematical order and beauty and, and so on, right? So at least a priori, right? It seems to my mind that there could have been, or that it's epistemically possible for there to be many, many, many more chaotic worlds that aren't orderly um, than there are worlds that are that are orderly, uh, precise, and you know, mathematically formulatable, uh, rationally investigatable, um, that facilitate science and so on. Um, and if that's the case, well then, you know, um, 
a priori, right? Like, what would we expect? Well, on the hypothesis of indifference, that is to say, reality is just fundamentally indifferent to uh, humans and to order or and to like a uh, aesthetic impulse and to things like that, right? On the hypothesis of indifference, um, I don't know, it seems as though it'd be more probable, at least epistemically speaking, right? Epistemic probability, it seems as though um, it'd be more probable that reality would just be chaotic. It wouldn't, it wouldn't really be supportive of long-term stable complexity and things like that and like mathematical order and beauty and an integrated cosmos and so on. Just because there seem to be so many more ways that, you know, reality could have turned out chaotic than there are that it could have turned out orderly. But on the hypothesis of difference, that is to say ultimate reality is, uh, is not indifferent to um, these types of aesthetic impulses, to science, to rationality, to order and uh, beauty and, uh, you know, things like that. It's much less unexpected that we would get a, um, you know, like an orderly, uh, integrated realm where, uh, you know, science is impossible, uh, reality is intelligible, right? There are, uh, whenever we look for explanations, there are explanations and things like that. So it's a sort of a priori epistemic fine-tuning argument that's that's really interesting. Um, and so, I, I, yeah, I want you guys to ponder that, to think about that. It's really interesting. Um, and so that that's something that, that kind of pushes me a little bit towards theism. With respect to fine-tuning, I, I still find the, the criticism somewhat plausible that I was discussing in my... Uh, in my discussion with Micah Edvinson on his channel, Crusade Against Ignorance, you can find that in my, uh, you can go up to playlists and click, like, my YouTube appearances or something, it should be in there, and I discuss, I discuss, um, the fine-tuning argument, and I basically present, uh, I present the argument that Aaron Lucas, philosopher Aaron Lucas, gives in his paper, I think it's, uh, Evolution, or no, Naturalism, Fine-Tuning, and Flies, I think it's called, and he basically, um, targets the fact that, um, the, the physicists, fine-tuning data is is uh, is restricted to um, laws that share the structure of the laws that we have in the actual world. And what Aaron Lucas points out is that we can't at least reliably and, you know, automatically infer from the fact that life-permitting worlds with that share our structure, we can't, we can't infer from the fact that that is a very small number or a very small proportion to the fact that all worlds whatsoever with other structures and laws um, are thereby, uh, you know, the, the proportion of life-permitting universes are thereby extremely small. Um, uh, and again, so it's a sort of undercutting defeater along those lines. And again, I'm not saying that that's a, a decisive argument or anything. I'm just, I'm just saying why I think that maybe a priori fine-tuning arguments might be actually more convincing than the sort of a posteriori, at least given the uh, the the scientific and physical limitations that we do have um, for uh, generating those those probabilities. Okay, and then the next arguments are free will and consciousness arguments. This is one. This is one of the arguments that I presented in my devil's advocate debate with uh, Randall Rouser. So definitely check that out. But at least like um. Under naturalism, it does seem somewhat surprising that uh, reality, which is fundamentally impersonal, unfree, could somehow give rise to free creatures, right? Um, it, it seems as though under naturalism, there's no like, there's no, there's no plausible directedness toward that um, as an end, and it, it just seems implausible that you could bridge that sort of categorical chasm from utterly non-conscious, utterly impersonal, um, utterly unfree bits of matter to somehow generate uh, things that are conscious and persons and genuinely have this sort of irreducible causal power of uh, freedom of the will, um, whether that be construed in libertarian or compatibilist lines, whatever. Um, and so, you know, uh, it, it does seem kind of expected under naturalism, but it seems much less unexpected under theism, right? Like, free will is so valuable, and like, consciousness, these things, like, they facilitate a relationship with your creator, they allow for for explorations, they allow for people like me to make videos like this, uh, and to serve you, and you can learn from me, and I can learn from you, right? I don't know, it just, it seems so valuable that, you know, you know, maybe I would actually expect it under theism. Um, and so, you know, it does seem to provide at least some evidence for theism. And then finally, uh, abstracta along sort of Augustinian or Leibnizian argumentation lines, right? Like abstracta, think about propositions. I mean, propositions uh, under standard accounts are like necessarily existing, um, immaterial, eternal. They have intentionality. They represent things as being certain ways. They can be true or false. I mean... You know, that just seems, just intuitively, that seems, they seem to have certain characteristics of uh, the divine intellect, right? Like, necessary, uh, eternal, immaterial, intentionality, um, yeah, they can correctly represent things or incorrectly represent them. They just seem to be mysteriously thought-like. And so maybe we could have a sort of unifying, simple, uh, explanatory account of propositions by just identifying them with divine thoughts. Now, I do have certain bootstrapping objections to that and so on. And I discussed some of those in my, one of, those, one of my earliest videos, it's, it's something like um, non-traditional arguments for theism, part one, I think.
yeah. So definitely check that out. I talk about abstracta and arguments for abstracta for God's existence. But you know, those at least have some plausibility to my, to my mind. And they have, so that some plausibility, that, that's a sort of a, maybe a, a chip or two in, fa in favor of theism or, or what have you. Let's move on next to um, certain books that I have found uh, rather enlightening, influential titles on me. So, um, you know, it's funny that all these are from Proust. Uh, of course, these aren't the only books that I've read. Um, yeah, I mean, I, there's one book that I haven't read. It's called The Majesty of Reason. No, I'm just kidding. That's a horrible joke. Uh, yeah, I mean, what can you say? Joe, joke, my name's Joe. Anyway, uh, now I'm just being stupid. So yeah, these books, definitely check those out. They're, they're really interesting by Rasmussen and Proust. So here are certain things that uh, draw me towards atheism and, uh, you know, against theism. So definitely number one is, is animal suffering. Just to, just to feel the, the brunt, the force of this, just like consider consider the evolutionary process, right? You know, we have good reason to think that, um, you know, consciousness, some form of sentience with pain and pleasure have been around for hundreds of millions of years, right? We know that um, vertebrates, which that, that's basically supporting a complex nervous system, we have good reason to think that those, those, those have been around for at least some hundreds of millions of years. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that there has just been so much profound suffering and languishing and predation and parasitism and carnivory and and just horrendous suffering on the part of animals for hundreds of millions of years. I mean just just think about your own life. Like you are around for maybe less than a century and you you only occupy one consciousness. Think about animals not only not only in in your town or your city or your state or your country, but all around the world, right? I mean we're talking about millions, maybe billions of animals around the world for a single day that are just, you know, they're, they're starving and they are, you know, they're being eaten alive and there's just so much suffering in a single day. Now multiply that day, think about that in a decade in the natural world. Just think about that. Every single day, millions, maybe billions, I don't know the number, but animals that are just suffering horrendously. And that's just a decade. I mean, think about a hundred years, a thousand years, 10,000, a hundred thousand years. Oh, well, let's make that a hundred million years. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to be rhetorical here, as you can see, but my point is this, that when you really reflect on the staggering, the staggering amount and intensity of animal suffering, you see a lion eating an elephant alive. You know, elephants are, elephants, you know, they, they have profoundly um, sophisticated mental capacities. Um, you know, when you see these things and you reflect on this, and, you know, like this sort of thing has been around for, Hundreds of, hundreds of millions of years on the entire planet. Um, well, that just seems, that seems very unexpected on the hypothesis of theism than on the hypothesis of indifference, that reality is ultimately indifferent to the suffering of animals. Now, of course, that's not to say that, you know, this is a sort of logical incompatibility. As you just heard me put it, I kind of put it in Bayesian terms. But there are different ways to put it. This is, again, a sort of family of arguments. And so that, that's one, that's one line of argument that I kind of find plausible. Another one is argument from horrors, so horrendous evils. Now, of course, some of these animal suffering cases are horrendous evils, but I mean, I'm kind of thinking about human cases, right? So, I mean, it doesn't take much to, uh, to think about the, the horrors, right? I mean, just, just, I, I, I dare you to try to read, right? Like, try to read accounts of the Holocaust. Try to read what they truly did to prisoners in Auschwitz. Truly. Try to, try to read that right? Try to go through those, those accounts, page after page. Try to go through the, the most horrendous torturing accounts that, that, you've, that you can find, like people, just the severity of the torture that they've undergone from other people, right? Um, and you might say, oh, well, that, that's free will. Yeah, but um, would we expect there to be such free will? It, it's all about the limits of the free will, right? Um, what we can do with our free will, um, and you know the 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 extent to which our free will is restricted and not restricted. Um, but again, that that's I just want to emphasize there's this almost intuitive seeming, and uh, Randall Rouser was was good at, at pointing this out uh, in our discussion in my discussion with him. There's just this intuitive seeming, right? And you know Trent Doherty emphasizes this. You know when you reflect on these cases, it's almost as though there's an intuitive seeming that these things are intrinsically impermissible. Um, and intuitive seemings provide evidence for the proposition in question, uh, so long as we're good phenomenal conservatives, conservativists, or however you pronounce it. Um, 
All right, so phenomenal conservatism just says that uh, if it seems to S that P, then uh, S has justification for believing that P, uh, at least a feasible justification. So as long as, you know, you consider some of these horrendous evils, and not all of them involve free will, some of them involve, you know, a baby's being, you know, ripped to shreds by an alligator, you know, things like that. Um, or, you know, some of the, some of the slavery literature uh, is just, ah, oh, man. You just get the sense that these things are sort of just like intrinsically impermissible for something that genuinely has the power, that genuinely wants to, uh, and so on, to prevent these things, uh, for it to uh, not prevent them, or at least to create a world in which such things are um, like genuine possibilities and, and so on. But anyway, obviously there are lots of different ways to respond to these these types of arguments. There are ways to respond to those responses. But I do think that the two most poignant, res um, I, I hope I pronounced that right, poignant, yeah, um, the two most poignant problems of evil, I think, are um, horrendous evils and animal suffering. And it's 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 difficult to to um, to find plausible responses to those. Um, yeah, but you know, there's there's skeptical theism. Clearly, you know, there's um, there's a sort of animal afterlife and so on, which raises questions about like the persistence conditions of animals and so on. But we need not get into those. I just want to give you a glimpse into what has uh, you know convinced me and and me right now. So th then the third one is the argument for material causality. Um, if you want to learn more about this, uh, I discussed it with Felipe and Mike Edvinson on my channel. It's, uh, I think it's titled Theism and the Argument for Material Causality. Um, I had Leon Felipe on, and um, yeah, basically, we have a lot of evidence from our experience that things that begin to exist have a cause. But pretty much any evidence that you can cite for that is also going to be evidence that things that begin to exist at least come from some sort of pre-existing stuff. Right. Um, and also, you know, there seems to be a sort of explicability requirement here. Like this is really what ultimately led Spinoza himself to adopt a sort of um, pantheism, right? Like he thought that it would just be inexplicable if you got extended stuff from non-extended non-stuff. And so that led him to think that explicability and intelligibility requires that whatever is ultimate, whatever is ultimate, it can't be something non-extended producing something extended or, you know, things like that. Um, again, that's not exactly Felipe's argument. I'm just trying to give you a, a glimpse of some of the justifications for the, the, the principle that whatever begins to exist comes from some sort of pre-existing stuff. Um, yeah, so um, explicability motivates it. Pretty much most of the arguments for the Kalam causal principle um, uh, support the argument or support the principle of material causality as well. And if that's the case, well then that straightforwardly entails that there couldn't be creation ex nihilo. And so that's a that's kind of like a core commitment of of uh, at least neoclassical theism and classical theism. And so it does it does at least provide some evidence for for atheism. It seems it seems to my mind again. These are all based on my personal site. So then uh, the next one is <laughs> abstracta. So I said uh, bamboozled, right? Because I, I had abstracta on the theist list, but abstracta also plausibly poses lots of problems for theism, right? So there's a lot of uh, bootstrapping problems if you're trying to identify abstracta with like um, God's thoughts or like God's concepts, right? It would seem that God would already have to sort of um, instantiate certain properties in order to account for there being such properties in the first place, like even being capable of thinking and being capable of having thought. Uh, it would seem that there would already have to be propositions describing what God is able to think and like that God exists, right? It would seem to have, there, there would already have to be propositions in order for there, for you to like plausibly identify propositions with some sort of active thought of God and so on. Um, so yeah, there do seem to be certain bootstrapping problems for that. Um, and what that might push us towards, that might push us towards, well, either anti-realism or maybe Platonism. But once you get into Platonism, that seems to be a threat to um, divine aseity, right? Like, God wouldn't thereby be the only ultimate fundamental reality, right? There would also be, like, a, a an infinite plenitude of of things that are apart from God that exist in, like, Plato's realm, right? That are, you know, necessarily existent, independent, right? They explain certain facts about creation, right? Um, they explain certain facts about, like, instantiation or whatever. Um, you know, that... that uh, or at least partly explain. You know, that, that seems to be a plausible problem for uh, divine aseity, right? And so uh, if we think that if God exists, then God is, you know, God has divine aseity, and if Platonism is true, then God doesn't have aseity, then we might think that pushing us towards Platonism pushes us against theism. We might think that. Again, this is just one, one uh, chip on the side of uh, atheism or naturalism uh, in my mind. Uh, and then this actually kind of <laughs> kind of brings us into the most hated argument. Um, I say this is the most hated argument because literally every theist is going to object to this. It's funny. But it basically takes what classical theists use to argue against neoclassical theism, but then it takes what neoclassical theists use uh, uh, in arguing against classical theism and basically just like brings them into an argument against theism as such. Um, so that's why that's why all theists will hate it because... Neo classical theists are going to object to one premise, neoclassical theists are going to object to the other one, <laughs> and so no one's happy except for the atheist. Um, 
yeah. But okay, so the most hated argument would basically be if God's it's something like again. I'm I, most of these are just off the top of my head. Um, if God is not absolutely simple, well then God is in some sense. God, in some sense, depends on something that is distinct from him for his existence. God wouldn't be the ultimate fundamental thing in reality, right? And so classical theists hear that, and they're like, yeah! And neoclassical theists hear that, and that they're just like, that is just BS. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it might seem possible. Like, if God has parts, well, then in some sense, maybe those parts are more fundamental than him, or he couldn't exist without them, so there's something that's just as fundamental as God, or, you know, things like that. I know you can get into, like, priority monism and so on, but ignoring those, that's the premise that uh, neoclassical theists will hate uh, but then we then we just say, well, uh, nothing could be absolutely simple, or like no god could be absolutely simple, and that's the that's the premise that neoclassical theists are gonna be like, yeah, and that's the one that cl classical theists are gonna be like, boo. <laughs> so um, you basically put these together, and you're like, well, if God exists, he would be ultimate, and you know he wouldn't depend on anything else. He'd be the most radical, ultimate, fundamental reality. But the only way for that to happen is for God to be absolutely simple. But there are so many problems for absolute simplicity that that couldn't be the case, and hence uh, the only way for God to exist. Uh, you know, he just he just couldn't. So um, it would basically be saying like, well, either classical theism or non-classical theism, but neither neither of them could be the case, and hence atheism. That would kind of be the the most hated argument, and I recognize that it's the most hated argument. <laughs> um, and so yeah, but you know that's that's kind of an interesting chip that I might I might put uh, plausibly favoring atheism. And again, these things I don't claim that they're like decisive. I know you've heard me say that about a bajillion times, but just deal with it, man um, or woman. Uh, the next thing is theological. I won't spend too much time on this, but it does seem plausible to me that, uh, long story short, if we take the Bible in certain senses literally, uh, there do seem to be abhorrent divine commands in there, like to genocide. To me, that seems incompatible with uh, perfect being theism, or at least very, very unexpected on it. Um, I do think religious exclusivism is deeply, deeply implausible, and so if any, you know, I would say that any form of theism that requires it or entails it, or religious theism or whatever, is thereby very, very, very implausible. I also think that if you're uh, if you're an exclusivist, you're going to have even much more trouble dealing with divine hiddenness because one of the one of the best responses to divine hiddenness, in my mind, is non-theists are in a relationship with God. They're they're seeking the truth and they're they're discovering things about the fundamental nature of reality, and in so doing, they are thereby growing in their relationship with God. Right. So, in some sense, you can be in a relationship with God. You can, in some sense, believe in God, even though you don't have the sort of explicit doxastic belief. Um, uh, yeah. But, you know, it seems to me that exclusivism has lots of troubles and difficulties with divine hiddenness. That, ex that inclusivism doesn't. And, of course, uh, eternal conscious torment. I'm with a lot of other, you know, philosophers and, and theologians these days that uh, it's not clear to me, at least, how, that, how that's uh, compatible with a radically perfect being. Or at least it seems to be uh, very unexpected. We're getting into lots of theological territory here that I'm not an expert in. So... Uh, it's just one sort of thing that might be a chip against theism, and against not 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 all forms of theism. Obviously, I look there. I put the little hashtag hashtag not all theists. Okay, um, and then uh, there, the next one is the louder Draper Leon bunch. So these are a bunch of pieces of Bayesian evidence. Um, maybe I'll do videos and blog posts on these at some point um, because. You know, with these just listed here, you're probably thinking like, how on earth could these provide Bayesian evidence for naturalism? But essentially. Um, yeah, a lot of these things are uh, either expected on naturalism and not as expected on theism and so on. Um, and so, you, and yeah, it's just the list there. Um, and, you know, there are uh, Draper and Louder, they go through the reasoning as to why these... I'm not going to do that here because, you know, this is getting a little bit long, so apologies for that. But hopefully you're enjoying this. I, I, this is going to be... I'm actually probably thinking this is one of my favorite videos thus far. But anyway, um, yeah, so it's like the existence of physical reality, success of naturalistic explanations. And none of these, of course, entail naturalism or anything. This is uh, Bayesian evidence. Biological role and moral randomness of pain and pleasure. That one goes back to uh, Paul Draper's... Uh, it's one of the most cited papers in, like, all of philosophy of religion, or at least all of the problem of evil. Um, yeah, his, his things on uh, pain and pleasure, um, the strong physical dependence of minds, neurological basis of empathy and apathy, that gets, that gets into the argument from... Um, uh, what was it? The argument from, um, yeah, so, uh, the neurological basis of empathy and apathy, that gets into the argument from psychopaths that, uh, louder has developed. And then geography and justice, that's, uh, really interesting. Uh, I think I touched on that in the next slide, but that's a really interesting, um, thing from, uh, uh, PhD student at Purdue University, yet again, boiler up, um, Purdue University, uh, Dan Linford, um, he developed uh, some interesting arguments about divine justice and uh, how it relates to uh, geographical distribution of certain 
uh, accidents of nature and so on. Um, and then Felipe Leon, he goes through 11 different pieces of evidence like revulsion and other other sorts of things in his book with uh, Josh Rasmussen. Um, and then also keep in mind that there are Bayesian evidences for theism too. And then finally, the simplicity of naturalism. Um, there are lots of debates here, but it does seem to my mind that naturalism is in some sense simpler than theism, right? Because what theism does is theism... Naturalism and theism, as Oppie puts it, they sort of have an overlapping ontology, except theism, in terms of their ontology, right, theism includes God plus the natural world, whereas naturalism just has that natural world, at least in broad broad strokes, right, the same ontology, except theism, at least broadly construed, uh, includes uh, God, which is a, 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 a not only a different type of being, so that's a sort of categorical simplicity or qualitative simplicity counts against it, but also quantitative simplicity as well. And again, there are different uh, debates there, but... Um, you know, some people might say, oh, well, naturalism has to have a, a plurality of fundamental particles that are just uh, brute, or at least they're metaphysically necessary, whereas, um, you know, theism has only one metaphysically necessary thing. Well, I mean, first of all, um, it's not clear that naturalism requires, uh, you know, this plurality of really distinct particles. Like, there could just be this one underlying quantum field, for instance. And, you know, actually, quantum field theory, we actually have good reason to think that fields are really, ultimately, uh, the fundamental uh, building blocks, as it were, of reality. But that's getting that's getting ahead of myself. So there could just be, for the naturalist, just one simple, well, not simple, but one extended uh, quantum field uh, that is metaphysically necessary that underlies physical reality and that accounts for uh, the contingent, less fundamental things of physical reality and so on, or whatever. Uh, my point is just that uh, it's not at all clear that uh, this would be a problem for the simplicity of naturalism. And so, at least in my mind, it does seem that naturalism um, has a benefit of simplicity over theism, and that's at least some mild probabilistic evidence for naturalism. So that, that video on the left, that is from Real Atheology. Uh, that is uh, an interview with Dan Linford. He basically describes his paper, God, Geography, and Justice, uh, which is on the right. Um, it's, an interesting, um, it's an interesting argument. Um, so yeah, definitely check that out. Um, again, not that this is like not that I think that this is like the decisive argument in favor of the uh, atheism. I just like thought that this was this was interesting, and I thought I'd plausibly include it. Uh, the next one, I, I do want to talk about some deadlocks between theism and naturalism. So one of them is sort of construction problems. So a lot of people think that you know, like, well, how on earth could you could you get like mind from mindless matter? Yeah, that that does seem to be a construction problem. Like, how could you construct minds from matter? Like this this qualitative aspect, this intentional aspect. But it also does seem, it does seem very weird in the opposite direction as well. Like, uh, while you cannot take sand and somehow smash a bunch of sand together to produce a genie, for instance, or, or a ghost, right? You also can't take genies together and ghosts together and, like, smash the ghosts together and somehow produce matter, right? And so there does seem to be this reverse construction problem. If there's a problem for naturalism from bridging the categorical gap from matter to mind, well then by the very same reasonings, or by the very same reasoning, it seems as though there's this categorical construction problem for theism as well, going from purely mental resources, purely immaterial resources, namely God, and somehow producing matter purely from those resources. The construction problem just seems to be seems to my mind, again, this is all about my mind, this seems to my mind to be equally pressing either way. And of course, it's also very, very mysterious how on earth you get other first personal selves from, uh, you know, like one first personal self. So like God, God is a first personal self, and it's, it's difficult to see how you could get, um, how you could construct, as it were, other first personal selves with distinct qualitative characters and, and phenomenology and so on uh, from this one uh, fundamental first personal self. Um, and again, like similar problems are going to be plaguing naturalism as well. <laughs> I hope Josh Rasmussen's watching this. Uh, he's He definitely knows what I'm talking about with both of these problems. We probably had like hundreds of emails going back on these two on these two construction problems, but anyway. <laughs> and then stage two, uh, cosmological arguments. I don't find stage two convincing. A lot of them are just saying like, oh, well, something that has limits, that's going to be contingent. And I don't know, that just doesn't seem plausible to my mind. God is limited, at least in respect of how many hypotheses or how many uh, divine persons there are. Um, and plausibly, that's just a necessary, metaphysically necessary limit in the foundation, right? Um, and if that's the case, if the theist can help themselves to that, then it seems as though the naturalist can equally help themselves to that. There's a sort of desire problem, right? So God's desires aren't going to be unlimited, uh, it seems, un uh, if we, uh, unless we want to sort of explanatorily disadvantage ourselves, right? Because I'll, I'll just be as brief as I can. Oftentimes, there are two incompatible states of affairs that God can bring about, but both of them are good in some sense, right? So he has some desire for both of them. Uh, but maybe one of them is, is, is much better than the other, but the other one still has some goodness. So God still has some desire for, for, for both, right? For either, that is to say, because they both have some goodness in them. Um, but he, he desires one of them much, much more, and that sort of explains why he brings about one of them much, much more. Or well, he brings about one of them. But like, if we're, if we're taking this argument from limits to its you know, to its to its extreme, as it were. If we really take take it seriously, it seems as though we're going to have to say that there aren't really 
limits in terms of God's desires. And so all of God's desires are going to be unlimitedly had, which it's very difficult to see then how we're going to be able to explain why, why, some, why some things obtain when uh, reality equally easily could have been some other way, given that God's desire for both of those states of affairs obtaining is unlimited, like an unlimited desire for both of them. Anyway, again, Josh Rasmussen knows what I'm talking about. I, I put this in much more precise analytic, analytic ease, as it were. That's the language of analytic philosophy. Uh, yeah, so he and I have gone, gone back and forth on that a little bit. And then finally, the necessary limits problem. So, I don't know, to my mind, it just seems that it seems quite clearly possible that there could be a, uh, you know, limits that are necessarily instantiated or necessarily had, and they are explained in virtue of that metaphysical necessity. Um, and so, if that's the case, I don't know, it just seems to me the naturalists could help themselves to um, a necessarily limited thing. But anyway, um, again, lots more stuff could be said uh, in terms of these, these types of arguments. I'm just trying to help you understand me more. It's all about understanding. It's all about perichoresis, guys. So I need, I need to explore more with respect to this debate uh, between theism and atheism, Gerdelian ontological arguments from like uh, Caesar Bernstein and Proust. Um, that's not to say I've ignored them. For instance, I, I've read uh, Caesar's paper, or was it papers, uh, on it, and um, also evidential and Bayesian arguments from divine hiddenness. You probably noticed that I didn't have divine hiddenness favoring atheism in there. That's because I, I do think that there are some, some plausible responses to divine hiddenness deriving from inclusivism. Uh, but, I mean, if you're, if you're taking an exclusivist line, then, you know, maybe I'm going to be... Uh, I'm going to be uh, more inclined to put divine hiddenness in favor of atheism. Skeptical theism, um, I need to research that in more in more depth. Again, not to say that I haven't explored it. The fine-tuning literature, yeah, I need to explore that in much more depth, mainly because I, I, I try to focus on metaphysics and, like, um, models of God. So, uh, yeah, and evolutionary debunking literature um, as well, especially the... Uh, or not especially, but including the evolutionary argument against naturalism. I just need to explore it further. Again, uh, I do have... Uh, views about the evolutionary argument from naturalism against naturalism. Um, I, 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 I would have had it uh, f in favoring theism if I thought that it succeeded. But, you know, it seems to me, at least uh, from my current position on the epistemic landscape, that um, the naturalist has some, some plausible responses to that. Yeah, so getting meta. Okay, so really, another thing that informs my agnosticism is sort of like meta-level data and evidence. So when I look at philosophy, right, I see that the literature is so vast. <laughs> and I see that my mind is so small in comparison with this vast literature. And you know, I don't know, there's just thousands of scholarly books and articles that I haven't read defending both sides. And this makes me quite tentative in lots in lots of respects. Now, as as you can see, like I'm not tentative in, in every respect. I literally just went through a bunch of different arguments that, that uh, convince me on, on either side, or at least pull my mind towards different sides. So it's not to say that I'm like, I like, uh, you know, don't commit to anything. But it does, it does introduce a lot of tentativeness into my mind based on this vast preponderance of literature that I just haven't, haven't had time or the energy to investigate. The literature is so vast, my mind is so small. Yeah, that, that's kind of my, my motto for this slide. Anyway, that, that, that kind of plausibly motivates some agnosticism, to my mind at least. I do think that uh, everyone should, should at least consider how, how vast things are and, you know, how many arguments that you might have never even thought of that are against your position that many really able thinkers have defended. But yeah, that's sort of all just about the literature and the vastness of it and the smallness of my mind. Yeah, so let's move on to the, the next slide. So now we're getting near the end of this presentation, sadly. It's one of my favorite, I think this is one of my favorite videos that I've ever done. Hopefully you like it. It's long, but you know, maybe this is, maybe, <laughs> I hope this is serving you. But here are a few resources for both sides. There's that shameless plug, The Majesty of Reason, A Short Guide to Critical Thinking and Philosophy. It's really good if you want to um, be able to critically think about a lot of these issues in, in, in much greater depth. Uh, and then Theism and Atheism, Opposing Arguments in Philosophy, uh, edited by Oppie and Kotursky. Um, so these are definitely, or the, this is the sort of collection of essays that's got people like Philippe Leon, Oppie, and a bunch of other really good philosophers um, arguing both for and against atheism and theism in there. Definitely check that out. And then Is God the Best Explanation of Things by Rasmussen and Leon? Definitely check that out. Um, here are just a few resources for the theist, uh, or for the theist side that you all need to, to check out. Two reasonably comprehensive treatments are the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology, and then two dozen or so arguments for God. And then also lots of specific treatments of particular arguments, like uh, if you want arguments from contingency, like uh, go to Proust and Rasmussen's work on that, that book, Necessary Existence. Here are some resources for the atheist, so definitely, uh, maybe I'll link this one in the description, Philippe Alion's blog post. He has, uh, he has listed six dozen or so arguments for atheism. A lot of them are links to different papers that a lot of other authors have, have uh, argued. 
Definitely also check out Louder's Secular Outpost, his uh, section there. That That's his blog there, uh, Arguments for Naturalism. And also check out infidels.org too. It has both arguments for and against atheism and theism, right? So definitely check that out. And then book of recommendations from my friend uh, August Dyerke. He gave, he basically gives nine of them. So, uh, Arguing About God by Robin Lepoitevan, The Non-Existence of God, The Miracle of Theism by J.L. Mackey, yeah, Logic and Theism by J.H. Sobel, Arguing About Gods by Graham Oppie, and so on and so forth. Definitely check all of these out. Um, if you want my two recommendations out of that list, um, or at least the two ones, the two ones that uh, I've read um, are uh, Logic and Theism by J.H. Sobel and Arguing About Gods by Graham Oppie. Those are my two main recommendations among that list of, of nine, but mainly because I, I don't think I've read any of the other of the other nine, of the other nine uh, apart from those two. But I, I plan to, so uh, we'll get there. And then um, here, uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is just for fun. So here are some of my favorite philosophers of religion, not in order. So in blue, those are the ones that are, like, my favorites. Uh, this is, again, this is no particular order. Uh, and then in gray at the bottom, those are just honorable mentions, um, just so people that you can, like, check out and look look further into. So for non-theists, of course, Paul Draper, Boiler Up, uh, Graham Oppie, Wes Morris, Philippe Bailion, and J.L. Schellenberg. I especially like the dispositions and just the, the, the way J.L. Schellenberg writes and goes about doing philosophy and just his intellectual humility, everything about him, man. It's great. And then the honorable mentions, of course, I got Stephen Meitz and Klaus Kray. I hope, hopefully I got that right. Uh, Nick Trakaki's Bede Rundle, J.H. Sobel. And then for theists, um, obviously Josh Rasmussen's going to be on there. Alexander Proust, Rob Coons, Ryan Mullins, Travis Dumsday, and Tim O'Connor. Uh, and then the honorable mentions, Jeff Brower, Boiler Up, uh, Brian Leftow, David Oderberg, and Bill Craig. Wait, oh, this is a concluding remarks. Single tier. Okay. Well, so this is a reminder. It's not comprehensive. Um, this is not a comprehensive video. Uh, you know, there are lots and lots of arguments that I didn't talk about and that I left out. And, you know, what's sad is that I probably forgot multiple very important things <laughs> that are, like, important that I just completely forgot to include in this presentation. And then one final note is just that, you know, the... Say, man, that was so loud. Okay, sorry about that. Um, the investigation never ends, right? Never let your curiosity be extinguished, right? If that's one thing that I want you to take out of this presentation, it is that. So I'm Joe Schmid. This is the Majesty of Reason. Peace out.